In this episode, I am joined by Shiv Mathur, YouTuber and spiritual explorer. Shiv recounts his life story, including his upbringing in India, 16 years of military service, and international career in information technology. Shiv describes how a growing spiritual calling saw him retire from the world of work to seek out spiritual masters in the Himalayas. Shiv shares stories from his search, including his encounters with Himalayan yogis such as Tat Wale Baba, and recalls how he began practicing in earnest with the teachings he received. Shiv also discusses his current practice, the pros and cons of remote retreat, how to find and relate to a guru, the process of purification, and shares his views on the trajectory of world civilization today. So without further ado, Shiv Mathur. Shiv Mathur, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for uh, you know giving me this chance to uh, be on your platform to share. I'm so delighted to be talking with you. and I've been very much enjoying your YouTube channel, uh, which is a very successful YouTube channel in which you share all kinds of spiritual thoughts. And also you share interviews and footage from your own travels into the Himalayas, finding and talking with various different saints, siddhas and yogis. So it's been a real pleasure to enjoy your YouTube channel uh, leading up to this interview. So that's uh, the even same here. I think I saw your channel and I saw a lot of interesting things, very different from some of the channels which I've seen. So I think it'll be a interest, interesting conversation. And I did see that you are doing a lot of Tibetan and Buddhist uh, kind of uh, uh, discussions and mine will be a little probably different uh, without any name, <laughs> nameless, cultless. Yes, that's actually something I'd like to get into. Your particular approach is, is, is very interesting. Uh, perhaps we could start with your biography. Can you say something about your childhood, your upbringing, the context of that time of your life? Yes, yeah, born in a family in Rajasthan, uh, and I was born in Varanasi, which is a famous spiritual place. And I lived in Rajasthan, which is a very historical place, belonging to the Rajput kings, and very rich traditionally. Rajasthan is still very rich traditionally, historically. It's it attracts most tourists. So I happened to live in a place called Kota in Rajasthan, and where I grew up in my schooling, studied in a Catholic school, Saint Paul's. And which was a, one of the best school in my city, and my city now the quota is known for. Uh, it's a center for coaching for I, admission to Ivy League medical and engineering colleges. So I also did my engineering. My family was pretty well off. We are from educated background. We basically a working community who work in government jobs administration. So I had my uncles working in different positions, high positions, bureaucrats, police officers, engineers, doctors. And I would say we were from pretty uh, stable family background. Particularly my father was not that well off, I would say, but overall the family was pretty well, doing well. And uh, so I have seen some challenges, financial challenges in my life. Everybody sees all kind of challenges and I had this urge to do well and overcome that and provide to my parents uh, better life uh, materialistically which we were told to chase those point of that point of time so I could get through an engineering and a good college and then I joined the Indian Navy because I was attracted towards military life and it also gave me a possibility of settling down faster because it's more organized in 89, uh, the private sector wasn't there, kind of. It was there, but not much. It wasn't very lucrative. The military job was considered to be still lucrative, equally paying well as much as private sector was paying to the in the beginning. But the private se sector was flexible. It took off. So, I, though, though, so, so basically, I continued in the Navy for 16 years. I worked in the missiles, surface to missiles, worked on destroyer class of ships. I also worked on a British ship, Leander class ship in 92. We had some Leander class ship, which is a frigate from UK. And we had an aircraft carrier from UK, which was, uh, which, which also fought in the 
this Falkland was, and then it was bought by India, INS Vikrant. I don't remember the name, the original name of it was what? Anyway, HMS, uh, I don't remember the name now. So poor memory. And then I worked in the nuclear submarine design in the last, and I worked in certain more assignments for 16 years in the Navy. I was instructor in the Naval Engineering College. So I was teaching some engineering subjects like electronics, microprocessors, and control systems. Then 16 years, after 16 years, I decided to quit Navy and the private sector came up and I thought I've got a good qualification to make a little more money and meet some other ambitions. And also I thought you know, progressing in Navy was a little unlikely because it's got a pyramid hierarchy. So I didn't see professionally growing and mentally stimulating and also financially remunerating. So that was a decision I took and I left my job without taking a pension from the government because you have to work for 20 years. And then I worked in large companies in IBM, Tata, Reliance Geo. I was assistant vice president in 2019 when I quit my job. And I was pretty successful. I have a daughter. She I could uh, afford to fund her education in France. She worked, she studied in France her college education for five years. She's into filmmaking, animation, VFX. She's settled down, married. Uh, my wife teaches economics. I lived in Poland in 2019. I went to Poland. Uh, my wife, she got a job in the British school. She was teaching economics. So that's my British connection. And obviously, India was ruled by Britishers earlier. So uh, I, I was in Poland. And in 2015, I got into the spiritual calling, very strong calling. And that was a parallel track which opened up along with working in the corporate in Reliance Geo, the big telecom company. I was managing the network security of the company at the function. And uh, apparently my spiritual calling started in 2015. I started going to the Himalayas and uh, had many spiritual experiences and uh, out of time and space, different, different experiences, which trans kept transforming me, kept opening different horizons, uh, you know, uh, giving a lot of answers uh, about different some aspects of life which were completely hidden from this day-to-day -day run of the mill life and that kept drawing me more and more towards in that direction so much so that i did achieve a lot of things mentally and spiritually and then i realized that this is something which a lot of people like to have and i should share it so i started got into teaching in Europe, and I started teaching from 2018. I went to Budapest. I was traveling to Europe every year since 2012. And I used to visit few countries every time. And uh, this was 2018 was just one of the trip. I went to Budapest and I took two workshops and they became very successful teaching about meditation philosophy. And then I said, I think this is what I should be doing in my life. And just it so happened in 2018, my wife got a job in Poland and I told her I want to leave my corporate job and I want to just get into this. This is something which I find very interesting and which is which is like uh, stimulates me mentally and I see this is very fulfilling for me. And it's my passion and this is what I want to explore. And parallelly what I'm gaining, I can also share with people who are interested and I have tasted some blood <laughs> in this uh, in Budapest and I think I'd like to continue that. So I, so I just built up a team and then we started, I could manage to conduct, organize some more retreats in Switzerland and some long one long course in Spain and then in Brussels. So I made some connections through yoga schools and we could organize and I could conduct that. Was very successful. And during my Himalayan visits, I also met some of the wonderful yogis in some remote places. And I thought that my urge was to also to showcase that such real yogis are there. Don't go to these commercial yogis. So uh, so so the, the, the desire was to Tell the Westerners that when you come to India, don't get stuck at these yoga schools and ashrams, which have become very commercial. And if you really want wisdom, go a little beyond this and also explore this part. Meet some real yogis, do some, make some, make an effort if you are really seeking. So that was my intention, and it was my curiosity to find such yogis to understand how what they did, how they lived in the remote. Uh, extreme conditions and gained all the knowledge. They left everything, but they got everything. They left everything, they got everything. See? So, so that was my curiosity. And I read some book by 
that's some in 2011 i had had got this curiosity about this yogi then i chanced upon a book i don't read books and i got this book written by paul brunton he traveled to india i think he was a britisher he's from britain and and it's a, it's a wonderful book i think a lot of people have gone through it and he also met a lot of yogis in india so that was a starting point but it was i i just touched upon that book and then life kept on moving and 2015 my calling came to kodu rishi and that's how my exploration started i used to go and stay in the ashrams but not do anything in the ashram but just roam around the places trying to figure out find out something which is not there in the ashram the ashram is like a, it's something for the beginners or and i was trying to go beyond that uh, finding these yogis that was my aim or finding some wise people see those vibrations of those places see what's happening how it, this place is so different why the people coming are uh, coming here from all over the world why do we call rishikesh a yoga capital what's so unique about this place so i was basically exploring not just following morning 6 to 6 an ashram routine and just go back explore that beyond this so that's what i was doing so that's in short about me and now i have come to some place a uh, very holy river which is again very unique it's the first time i am coming here and i am finding this is something another kind of a box in the spiritual world which i have not explored i was all into the himalayas and this is another pandora box it's narmada river i actually don't want to reveal because i've just come here five days back and i want to be in uh, isolation i don't want to inform people but now this is the podcast i think i should be telling where i am and so i'll be now exploring this area so i'm basically now here to live a life of solitude and doing self inquiry to further get into the depths of creation understanding the creation not from any cult or from any books but my own self discovery which is the way everybody teaches tells all the scriptures tell but we tend to go back to the scriptures books and some gurus we keep quoting we are like we are like a repeater we we become like a repeater it's so something is written here something is said by that something is and i feel i'm not talking to a person but i'm talking to somebody who is just basically a repeater so i don't want to be a repeater i want to discover everything myself like like if i tell you how the something taste till the time you don't taste it how will you know you can I can read a book and tell how the apple is, but if the time I don't eat an apple, so it's like that about this knowledge also. And you have to find it yourself. You have to experience it. The three ways of learning: book, listening, and experiential. So I somehow got into experiential learning, which was self inquiry, and it was just naturally it happened. Uh, it took me in that direction. Maybe from past life, I I just don't know, but probably some leftover. Uh, but the recipe, uh, you know, where I had to begin in this life from somewhere, and that was a natural way, which I was following probably from the past, and that's how it happened. Is I don't have any reason to say why I was following this self inquiry only, why I didn't like like to read books, why I didn't want to learn from books. I have now my reasons to understand and why book learning is how it is different and not so valuable compared to when you do your own exploration. And where did you say you are exactly? I am in a place called Narmada. Narmada is a river. So Narmada is a river which also came from Lord Shiva. Like Ganges is one holy river which was sent by Lord Shiva. Narmada was also created by Lord Shiva. So both are equally holy. And Narmada has a whole lot of spirituality. It's a. I feel it's has some spirituality. stretch around the entire bank of the river the entire bank of river which is about a, if you go across the, around the river it's about i believe i'm not sure it's 5000 km i'm not sure how what is the distance i I'm, i may be very drastically wrong but the entire river bank the, the river starts from east around east, eastern india and goes to the western india into the arabian sea so it traverses through the country across the breadth of the country and it's from central india and all along the river there are ashrams all along the, every 5 km there's an ashram every 5 km there's a saint 
every five kilometer there's a saint. So this stretch is filled with saints, uh, which is not the case in uh, Himalayas. Himalayas, the yogis are living a life of solitude. And here it's different. And there are people doing pilgrimage like Camino Santiago. Similarly, in Narmada, people are doing circumvulating the river. They're going around the river. And so a lot of people doing it. So the, there's a season where the entire road is filled with pilgrimage, pilgrims who are going around the river. And those people, they live in the ashrams free. They're given free food. Every ashram gets 100 to 200 people every day. And they just find place and sleep. It's not that you lay 200 beds. And it's a very different way of living. And they're given free food. And how the whole system runs, how the saints create these ashrams, all kind of saints. So it's a lot to see here, a lot to see. But I have a different purpose. I have a very different purpose here too. I'm enjoying the divinity of this living around the bank. And there is a small hill in front of me. So there's a hill just across the road and there is a river bank. And it's like a kind of a forest. I mean, it's not a village. So it's very serene, very tranquil. So I'm enjoying it this year. And here I can I feel I can do my self-inquiry uninterrupted by the worldly disturbances. That's what I feel. So there's a lot in what you've said that I'd like to ask you about, including mm -hmm. uh, your experiences of saints and of sacred places and what you've learned about both of those categories. But I'm also curious about your spiritual calling in 2015 and the initial experiences. For example, you had profound experience of Samadhi when you met a particular saint and that also, I think, impacted you a lot. So can you talk about those early days of spiritual calling and what that was like and how you responded to that spiritual call? Yeah, I think generally this question is the most favorite question in all the podcasts. Yeah, but you have framed it very differently. And uh, yeah, these uh, experiences, something which teach us, though we have experiences happening every day in our life, but we are so busy in the materialistic world. But about this calling was, uh, there was also some background, I would say, to this calling, because when you go through some situations, I was in Jakarta for four months from my company, Tata, where I was working for a project for about four months, and I was getting a lot of money. Then in 2015, I left Tata, I went to Saudi Telecom in Riyadh, again, getting a lot of money. But both the places, I felt, you know, that money is not everything in life. You got to, uh, the priorities should be different. And living a simple life is more important. Be with the family is more important. That was my desire. And that was my kind of, some kind of awakening, which I had, realization. And finally, I left my job in Saudi Arabia due to various reasons. And when I came back to India, I was... It must change a lot, and it was too much for me to go through these professional changes. And then I got a job in Juniper Networks in the American company, and then I, after a few months, I moved to Reliance Geo. But when you have these kind of instabilities in career and profession, they, they do make some impact on you, and then you even get to thinking more, what is the, what the hell is life all about? despite being educated, there is no certainty in life. You cannot, the life doesn't seem to be in your control. And what are you chasing? So many questioning starts. And I had many questions happening a couple of years back, especially after reading that book from Paul Brunton. There was some subtle questioning going on. And uh, I was doing some self-inquiry unknowingly. So uh, in 2015, uh, when I came back from Saudi Arabia and I was working in Juniper, I was to kind of kind of looking for an escape from this whole mess. When do I get an escape? Because I realized this is not life and one has to somehow get out of it. And one has to see what, what exactly is needed in life. And you know, so this kind of questioning started coming and I had a very strong urge to go to Rishikesh. That was like, uh, cannot explain that, how it happened because these kind of urges don't come so like desperate. Um, 
some kind of unexplained calling, I would say. I can't really explain because you have desires to travel somewhere, visit somewhere. But a urge to go somewhere for some unknown reason was is very difficult to explain. So I just uh, couldn't stop myself. And I just took two weeks, two weeks off and I traveled to Rishikesh. And that's where I started exploring. I wanted to know if was any realized soul living here. So I searched on the net and I came to know about Tat Pale Baba and I started trying to figure out where is where was he, where was his cave. So it took me three days to figure out finally where his cave was. That's another interesting story to say, but the podcast will become very long. I went to that cave and had many uh, some great experiences. Uh, experience of uh, going blank in the mind, so which we can call nirvichar samadhi or nirvikal samadhi. So if you are thoughtless, that's also like a samadhi. And when you are completely thoughtless, you are in a state of bliss. It's like pure thoughtless state, pure a pure state. And I would say today I'm not in a pure state. Today I may be having some attachments, some trappings of the world still coming back. But I would say 90% I have achieved or maybe 85% or 95% that I cannot quantify right now. But probably those moments, there are, there are moments in life when you go, uh, uh, that you go into that pure state. So probably the energy of that samadhi of that Baba, Tatpale Baba, and that vibration, so over there and my elevation through self-inquiry my preparation which I went through could elevate me further and take me to that state scientifically and that, that's what because there has to be some reason why that happened and I, I always correlate with consciousness and energy because I, my understanding is that this whole creation is energy and we are at, operating at different energy levels different planes so if you go into a higher plane through pure consciousness and, and you can go beyond these two dimensions of space and time, you can go into the other dimensions which we don't perceive through our five senses. Then you can uh, connect to that consciousness, that level, and have some experiences which cannot be described through words. And uh, those experiences will then tell you that uh, the world is not what you see. The world is much beyond this. The universe is infinite. We say the well, universe is infinite. But what is that infinite? You can not even imagine or even perceive it or even not experience it even through those experiences because you don't know till what dimensions have you actually seen that even in those experiences. But it definitely tells you what you're living is all nonsense. The world is not that. You're living in an illusion. And we have to understand that illusion. And you have to understand what is the purpose of life. You have to understand what exactly you are. So there are a lot of things to understand for the humans who are chasing something which is very futile and they've created a whole environment of chaos and they are you know, engulfed in that chaos, in that mess, in that slush and they don't realize like for a pig, a pig for a pig sitting on a heap of garbage is like a comfortable sofa. So we are also created those kind of garbages which we feel is a sofa or a couch, but it's actually garbage. And we all feel that we are in a garbage. So we are in a sofa. So we are living in an illusion. We have created illusion, these uh, worldly things. Like I was talking to somebody, she said, we, we have all the luxuries. I said, what is luxury? I said, do you think that's luxury? Are you happy in that luxury? Or you are happy here in the, on the bank of the river? But you think that's luxury, you have defined, you, you have defined things. Which are on materialistic basis, you know, you know, you drifted away from the reality of life, the nature, which gives the bliss. But what you think is, you call it luxury or comfort, is actually making you lazy. Comforts make you lazy. So these are all perception and wrong understanding which has been heaped upon on the society and brainwashed. And for, I mean, there's a whole lot of things, like I've written a book on social problems, social pandemic, which starts from the change of yugas and true change of yugas, how the human thinking got distorted and, de you know, decayed. It's, you know, deteriorating and how it is impacting the mind and the society. So I've written two books 
from the same trigger, but how the impact is on the mind and the society. So two different aspects, two different books. Well, some people want to understand the fall of society, the decay of society, the collapse of civilization, civilization which we I do see is likely to happen, and change of yuga. So I have done some connecting of dots and written these two books. Uh, so that's about my experiences. Then I had a couple of more experiences in different other places, and uh, uh, which are again about time and space, and they take you to a state of bliss. I don't know, should I be telling each and every of them, but you know, it doesn't make sense because they are part of your journey when you are purifying, elevating your energy levels. You come across different experiences with people, some yogi, or at a place, and they keep lifting you. And if you go back to the same place again, they will not lift you further because they've already lifted you at a level which they could have lifted you. So if if you feel that uh, I will go there again and I'll have the same experience. Now you already gone to a delta change and you you need another delta beyond that. So the whole idea is that I'm trying to see how much can I elevate myself? What is still left to be purified? What got purified for those moments? Why some impurities still came back? So it's like a seesaw, which is, you know, slowly, slowly like a, wave you're moving up and then you come down a little bit then you try to move a little more you're trying that uh, change of energy and like they say samadhi one of the samadhi is that when you raise your consciousness so high your energy levels so high uh, you can move away from the higher band of the energy because we have we are operating in a certain energy band humans have been designed to operate in a certain spectrum and a certain band of energy as a because uh, everybody will operate in a certain energy band. When you fall sick, you go down from the lower energy band because your energies go down when you are unwell. And you reach some stage of terminally ill when your energies are so low. So you go down from the lower band and the yogi can uh, go up from the higher band. And that's what it's called releasing from this body. And that's also a samadhi. <laughs> and then you can go into astral plane and then you, then there is, you can also come back. And you can also leave it. So Samadhi also has different definitions. And my goal is to experience that Samadhi where I can leave my body. But uh, there are many challenges presently. Uh, so I'm slowly trying to work on that and move to, in that direction. What sort of challenges are there at the moment? Challenges is, uh, if you look at the Himalayan yogis, they move to they look for the ideal place, first of all, because physically you want to cut off all those physical challenges which the world keeps showing. The people around you, if I am here, do I get the, that solitude? Do I have an uninterrupted environment where I can do my self-inquiry or meditation for hours together? For getting food, probably, for days. And is that possible? And uh, can I withstand the extremities of that con uh, environmental condition. If I go to 4,000 meters high, can I withstand, can I adopt to those conditions? Can Or should I go to something at 3,000 meters or 2,000 meters? How remote? What challenges? Like last year, I was living in a place called Dev Prague in the Himalayas, which is not that remote. But I was living off the highway, little above the mountain, close to the, uh, the beginning of the forest. That was like a trailer for me to kind of explore living in the Himalayas, a little, little remote and experiencing the nature more closely. And ultimately, I would say I would like to be in the forest, but then you have certain fears. Okay, how can you adjust to the forest? What about the animals? What about this? So there are all kind of small, small challenges. Can you find somebody, a saint with whom I, you can live, who's living in the remote? So I have... Uh, uh, I am in touch with one saint where I was supposed to be going next month who lives at 2,400 meters height in a, near next to a lake in the, in the Himalayas. It, uh, it's a little remote. And so, but in between, I've come here and I might go there. So uh, challenge is to find the right place. So most of the yogis who finally find a place, they take a lot of time as per my understanding and as per the the conversations that I have had with those, some of those yogis, they take time to reach and find those places. So a lot of exploration is needed. A lot of traveling is needed. 
because you want that perfect environment and the perfect surroundings in the from non interfering point of view non disturbing point of view uh, physically and then the environmentally you have to see how you adopt and then comes actually your sadhana which will subsequently happen once these things are in place so right now i'm having these kind of challenges i would actually prefer that i can create my own place and then you need funds for that you need to get a land and i have some kind of challenges happening right now due to some challenges in my personal life though i had earned a lot financially but i am right now presently going through some personal and also because of that there is some financial bottlenecks which have come so i cannot presently not create my own place a cottage small piece of land so that i can at least get rid of all those physical challenges and i can have my own setup then i can pursue my uh, sadhana so i have to do something like that which all the yogis do that they don't create their own place they don't spend money but they struggle to create that place on their own supported by nature and that's not easy that you need a lot of will power and overcome a lot of fears to leave everything go penniless and try to survive in the nature and then somehow everything gets all the pieces come together and so you basically don't depend on something of your past neither your money nor your wealth you go all with a blank slate so this is something which i am now not fully cared up mentally but i am slowly moving towards that so that this is also a process it's all a process it takes time you mentioned sadhana i'm curious from 2015 were these uh, various saints giving you practices to do did you follow a particular regime of practice or nothing 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 see the only practice is self inquiry the, the biggest practice is self inquiry because you want to unravel something which is there inside you everything all the knowledge is probably embedded in your soul you have to ex- uh, tap it and if you are tapping external if your connections are external so you don't tap the internal so till that time you don't disconnect completely the external the internal tapping will not be completely uh you not be able to tap it completely the internal uh, the internal connection so so to disconnect that first thing you have to disconnect this and this is in a very simple what i am saying but there's a whole process of disconnecting a lot of things external and then to go there like going into a laboratory to do that study so i have to create my laboratory in the himalayas to do be able to do that study and what is self inquiry in in is you say it's the most important practice how does one do it actually self inquiry is what uh, self inquiry is keep asking the right questions and uh, you have to be 100% focused your mind should not be wandering if i want to think about how the planets are you know pro- provided a fixed coordinate in this universe any planet in any solar system so who has the answer so if you want to find that answer you may you may require to do some self inquiry continuously for maybe 8 hours and that is what was tapasya and meditation what these rishis did in the past ancient times so self inquiry is something like philosophy you are a philosopher every scientist is a philosopher because uh, he has to do a lot of thinking to find out something if i have, if i decide that i want to create something some device anybody who created a mobile phone any technology which is being invented so there is a lot of thinking going behind that and when you think about some technology so you develop something more than that and from that you think this is possible so you think of possibilities and so you have to think a lot of thinking goes it's not that i just think momentarily a lot of thinking goes so this is what is a philosophy every scientist is a philosopher aristotle socrates any of the philosophers they 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 did unravel a lot of mysteries about the planets in, in those days similarly the rishis and munis in india the yogis they also unraveled and they how did they unravel they didn't have a telescope they did it through so self inquiry is a logical analysis so for a scientist he has to do 
uh, he has to look at something to find out something and then do self questioning. You are constantly questioning and isolating something which may not be possible logically. So there's the logic, science is logic. So you are doing a log logic reasoning through your brain and you are processing it, rejecting, accepting, rejecting something, accepting something. So you're doing a logic like a software, which has got conditional. Like if you have electronics, you have gates, AND gate, NAND, NAND gate. So through those, you create those algorithms and all that. So, so you are actually doing that only. It's, it's a, like a prototype. The software is like a prototype of what you're doing analysis because the software is also created through those analysis only. But if I have to achieve something, then I'll do this kind of processing. And if it is, it's very mathematical, it's also physics. So there is a combination of different sciences at a very different level to find some more than, uh, and we are at a very lower scale in modern science, but if the same concepts, if you scale up and you do the same logical to find something very interesting, um, uh, which looks very mysterious with a prolonged duration of uh, meditation. Meditation is basically you are con continuously introspecting, contemplating, logical thinking, reasoning. In the mind, you are doing all the calculation. You don't need a pen and paper. So you are doing everything all. The mind is very sharp, fast. It's uh, multiple times faster than what you can do with pen and paper. So if you can do those, if you develop those mental abilities, which we have, we do mental maths. We improve our mental ability, calculation ability. So mind is very powerful. We don't know the power of mind. So when you do those kind of constant mathematical or, or scientific analysis, philosophical analysis, you create those assumptions, you create formulas, you create the database within the mind, and then you do all the analysis, you do averaging, you do a lot of things. And you, the mind is calculating at a tremendous speed, which we also cannot perceive compared to what you will do with a computer or a paper as a data bank, a data analyst. Scientist is a data analyst of some great scale, which I know, which we cannot really uh, assume. The, the mind is working so fast, we also don't know. And the kind of answers when it starts giving, you also don't know because you've not written it down. It's all happening in the brain. So that whole process will start giving you answers. And when you're doing it with full focus, which is called dhyan, dhyan is meditation. The meditation is actually uh, do dhyan, focus. Focus on something for a prolonged period till the time you get the answer. That is what these scientists or rishimunis do. The rishis are also scientists. The way, the methodology, I'm interacting a lot. I'm doing a lot of study on NASA scientists. I had a podcast with a NASA scientist and uh, I'm looking into ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization. I'm seeing what kind of science. I'm also uh, seeing some lectures from MIT, Stanford scientists who are working on neuros neuroscientists brain and mind and and I see Sarah Walker and this Rebecca Sachs and so many of them. I also saw, heard Isaac uh, Asimov, who was a science fiction writer and he's a great guy, great predictions. So, and then I'm accumulating, assimilating what the modern scientists are doing, how they are limited. And one other lady told I'm, I'm a data science analyst. This lady is in Cambridge University or Oxford University who's doing a research on galaxies. She said, I'm a data analyst because the observatory is sending a lot of data and this data has been collected over a period of years and they are only creating simulations, writing softwares to do the data analysis. So they are a data analyst. Now the data is has very highly limited. The data is limited in space and time dimension because you are only depending on a telescope which is taking photographs and you are taking photographs of something which is billions of light years away. And what you see from the photographs will have no meaning actually because you, you are making inferences from a data which is unlikely to be true. You are, if you take a photograph of something which is a Milky Way, which is a galaxy, which is billions of light years away, how can you say that this can be the basis of my uh, analysis? I feel we are, our, uh, our beginning is, is also very primitive, I would say. It's very, uh, with great limitation. Mind, if you see astrology uh, in India, we have temples uh, we, where we worship nine planets, and those temples are thousands of years old. So, you mean that in 1779, somebody discovered the universe? No, those planets were discovered long back by the philosophers and the rishis and muni, and we have scriptures uh, saying that. Then, how do you say that you, these planets were discovered in the last century? It's all farce, and we don't uh, give any credentials to the scriptures. We are talking, we have temples. 
which are thousands of year old, which are worshipping planets, nine planets. So we are planets of nine planets. So there is so much of information still available, which says that our technology was so advanced. There are some temples in uh, uh, south, beautiful temples, which are actually very scientific. They talk about uh, Orion uh, constellation, the different constellation, and they're correlating with, with that, with mythology, Shiva, and Shiva's consort, and Shiva's this and that, and everything is pretty, correlation is there. So we don't know about, we have no idea about the science, but we can see something on the temples, which is talking about some absolute science, some magnificent science. NASA and German labs have stolen uh, these manuscripts from India, and they study those manuscripts because there was a technology of Vimana, uh, the UFOs, which we talked about. So people are know that there were Vimanas, there were the Mahabharata war, there were some weapons which were very, very advanced. We do know that there are some proofs, but uh, how do we, can we discover that? Can we create that with this modern science? No. So that's why this self-inquiry is a very, very important thing. And all my scriptures, which I have read, some of, some of the scriptures I've read, they all talk about self-inquiry. There's a very good scripture called Yoga Vashishta. It's a conversation between Lord Rama and his Guru Vashishta. It's a spiritual, very, at, at the discussion of consciousness. It's, they are all talking about consciousness in that entire book. The whole conversation is about con consciousness. It's very difficult to understand. It's a very high level book. And in that, he's told only thing, the only path is self inquiry. And I totally believe in that. Uh, I don't believe in. Because when you read a book or you listen to some concepts, you block your mind. You are actually blocking your mind. You are allowing only one way traffic and feeding that and accepting it without really knowing it. I made a video on knowing on believing. So a lot of people are just believing blindly because it's written in that book. But how, how can I know how the apple will taste if I read how it tastes in the book? So the point is, even those scriptures are telling, find out yourself. Now finding out yourself is very difficult in this world. Who can find that? So... It's complicated. <laughs> That's fascinating. And how does one tell the difference between a real saint and, like you said before, the commercial yogis? In your searching, I'm, I expect you you honed the ability to find and identify these sorts of people. How do you tell the difference? Yeah, a lot of people ask, and I made a video on this. I made a video on how to find a real saint. I made a video on just fake saints. I made a video on real gurus. And one was how to find real gurus. And I also made a video on bookish gurus who have only bookish knowledge. You know, so there are, I've got four videos on gurus. Uh, so the point is this question that how to find a real saint is, first of all, uh, a real saint will not be creating an empire. His uh, lifestyle, the way he body language, then what he's talking. If you hear someone talking, he may bluff you by, if you listen to him for a couple of discourses, you still may not be able to decipher or decode that he's bluffing. Maybe after a couple of discourses, you might catch that he's not the ultimate. So any, uh, a lot of these gurus, they learn a lot of things about life and they start uh, designating themselves as a guru and they are marketing, they're making a lot of effort to market. That's another way to find out that how much effort this guy's made, how he is now become that guru, what has he done? Why, what all he's doing? So I see a lot of people, a lot of these gurus are doing great amount of marketing and what all they do, I see that. But people don't see behind the uh, curtain what's happening. They see the image which has been created. They don't see how that image came. They don't, they don't do that kind of uh, study. That's one aspect. But I would say uh, before that, that I generally don't want to judge. Some, some, some people are very obvious that they are fraud. They've created such big empire. They're creating ashrams out of the ashrams. They are spreading their empire globally. They have ashram here and they have ashram there. And they, they, they have followers from all over the world also now. But that doesn't mean that he's a great guru because today the world is getting more and more fake with passing time. And then it's becoming more and more difficult to really identify. So my whole idea was that the guru who's running after fame 
and selling courses and creating those huge townships. And then, then you also come to know some stories they have. Not that the guru would be having something perfect life. Maybe some phase of life, he must be living an imperfect life. He must have done wrong things. That's okay. That's totally acceptable. But today, is he doing everything right or not? That's very important. How he's uh, done. So a lot of people go in the right direction and they then they fall. They get trapped by the illusion and they start running out of fame and money. And uh, so we have to see. But my point is that if I listen to someone, I will just take what is good. And if I see now, this is over. Like I have gone to a teacher who teaches in class four. So I will only learn how much he knows in class four. I won't, but he's still a teacher. I have to look for somebody who can teach me in class five or class six or higher classes. And then once I know he cannot teach me for the next class, so then I have to go. It's, it's just something like this. It's, this is a this is an unorganized sector where we uh, are not designated that I am a teacher of class nine or a college professor or I'm a university professor. It's undefined and uh, that's the problem. So we have to make some decision as you also elevate yourself through your effort. You will connect, you will look for something who will tell you beyond this. So when somebody's in kindergarten and stay continues to stay in kindergarten in this world and he, he is unable to move, so so he will hit those gurus who, who will have very limited teachings to be given. So probably you can call them fake gurus or fame, gurus after fame. But as you move up, you go to the university, you want to do PhD. So then you will have to search those gurus who are not running because the higher the professor is, the lesser the number of students he has. And the higher the yogi is, we are probably difficult to find. So there is there are more teacher teaching in kindergarten than PhD. So it's something like that if I give an analogy. So I hope I convey the point. And the lifestyle, the real guru will live very austere, simple, He'll be a very simple guy. He will have immense knowledge. He will be not be looking for fame. He'll be uh, not uh, chasing material wealth or fame or creating ashrams. And uh, I think there are different factors. And when you interact, uh, if you've also evolved, then you will connect with those kind of gurus. Otherwise, you'll not understand them. You will be chasing somebody who's pleasing your ego. Because most of the people are trying to convince themselves that what they know is the best. So a lot of these gurus are actually convincing you. So the mass which is going to these people, the masses, they are only looking for their own con uh, convincing their own knowledge, not really trying to learn. So a lot of people are not going to the uh, guru to actually learn from them, but only to validate what they think is right. So it's a very complex thing because it's not so simple to really... Uh, but I think if you do this questioning, this kind of questioning, you will probably be more intelligent enough to just do a discrimination between the guru which you would like to choose. But if you yourself is not are not ready, so it's not about that everybody should know who is the right guru, who is a good guru, but they also should first think that are they also prepared. If I am not prepared, uh, what will I do with a PhD professor if I am in class 5? So that's another aspect of that, which is very important. And what does it mean to be prepared? Prepared that uh, if, if I am in class four, I should be totally dependent on the teacher. I have to do my self-study. So this self-inquiry is, because this is an unorganized sector, so it is not defined. So it is pretty similar to what we do in the model school. It is pretty similar. No class is defined. No teacher is defined. There's no book. But we have to do our self-study. If you see, if you equate it, that if you don't do self-study, uh, you can't just memorize and give an exam. It is not like modern science that you have to score marks. You have to clear those concepts. So for that, you have to do a self-study. Self-study is self-inquiry. When you do self-inquiry, you get a lot of answers. So when that's called preparation. The main preparation to meditation is a state of mind. To reach that state of mind, of thoughtlessness, a samadhi state, you need to prepare. You can't go to some magical guru or guided meditation or this meditation and this meditation, that brand, or this brand, some technique. They will all fool you. You have to do through self-inquiry. You have to understand how the minds are 
mind is operating, how the brain is processing thoughts, from where are the thoughts coming. This this is a science. And this will reveal only when you uh, do a logical scientific analysis of the functioning of the human brain and the human body. Uh, to understand the whole body as such, to whatever level you can understand. But brain is a logical part. Uh, it's doing a lot of the logical processing. And through that logical processing, it's giving all the commands for functioning of the physical ob organs. So it's a combination. Brain is like a CPU. It's a controller. And then the body is like a machine. Brain is doing all the processing and the, we have sensory organs because sensory organ gets all the inputs. So inputs go to the brain and the brain gives a command. What we eat also gives input to the brain because what we eat may not be what we need. We might be mostly we are eating what we don't need. So we also are not clear about what we eat, different inputs to the body, what we think, that's another input. What we take except from the sensory organs or what we don't. Like if you are in a naval ship, you are in a war zone, you go into radio silence, you're not supposed to transmit. But we as a human are constantly transmitting, constantly receiving. We don't have any hygiene of mind. We don't have a hygiene of body. We don't have hygiene of food. So we, we are just flowing without knowing scientifically. We don't work on a human body. We, then That's why we don't understand. If we understand, if we try to understand, we follow some discipline, create a routine, a lifestyle, what we should do in life. So it's, it's pretty huge. It looks very huge from, from point of view uh, that uh, what we are doing is right or not. One of the markers of a saint is said to be Siddhi powers of various types, such as uh, knowledge of past lives or knowledge of the future or communication with beings different sorts of beings. I'm wondering, in your experience, in your travels and your own practice, uh, what's your view on this area of Siddhi? See, Siddhi is, as your mind expands, when you have these kind of experiences, many things do happen. And I don't try to remember them, actually, because it's not good to remember them, because because those things happen with everyone who's on the path of raising his consciousness and mind expansion. And uh, those things may happen, few things happen with me also. But uh, although the experiences are also have some reason, when you go to higher planes, when you are evolving at the energy level, your capabilities increase, your intuition, your perception, your vision, what you can call, how much you can see, or how much you need to see. So all that increases, and maybe for a lot of saints, because I have no measurement, measuring instrument, but yeah, I'm sure some of the saints I visited will have some visions. I also many times experienced I could read somebody's I mean, like an x-ray. Sometimes I felt I can do an x-ray of a person. Those things happen sometimes, but not always, because and they are not to be used, and they are not to be displayed. So if I go to meet a saint, I never try to uh, investigate or look into those areas where I have to look at his, his siddhis or even understand if I really got something or not, I don't really try to bother about those things because that's not my goal. The goal is basically a very different. Oh, sorry, the light went off. I'm sorry that the power failure. So, okay. so I can continue talking, but then maybe we can have a break if you want. Uh, uh, yeah, why don't you keep talking? I can sort of see you. <laughs> Okay, okay, fine. Okay. Uh, so, uh, unfortunately, this is a very remote place. These challenges. Oh, it's come. Oh, there we go. It's a, a short break. So, Siddhis, Siddhis are not, uh, I feel Siddhis are not something one should really look for. What, what is the point in looking for Siddhis, basically? Um, I will ask you a cross question. What do you gain out of that? Because if you can get some knowledge from that, which you are looking then it makes sense. But if, if you are only looking at a mystical thing, then how does, what is the purpose of knowing that? It's not about doing some miracles. If I have a Siddhi to cure somebody, should I start using that? Because I'm not supposed to interfere 
with the god's plan or the god's creation or the, the science of the universe i am my it just happened those things are coming on my path and they will keep coming and uh, ultimately i am getting to know a lot of things now people can call it siddhi but those are the kind of capabilities i would say when you go to higher planes so capabilities are inherent in us you just not you are creating something you are only exploiting those capabilities which are there by purification and those elevation of energy levels hmm. could you say something more about purification you've mentioned that word a few times now yeah, purification is something which is uh, uh, kind of a aspect to explain what is meditation is purification of mind because uh, purification is uh, you have many thoughts unnecessary thoughts uh, coming then how can you focus how can you do a self inquiry if i am sit, trying to sit and do self inquiry and if i have uh, too many thoughts so my mind is not purified uh, from the mind point of view because i am distracted by too many things why i am distracted that something which i have to purify i have to clean that so i have to clean my uh clean i'm saying this emotionally or literally but if you see scientifically i have to uh, reprogram my brain and control my senses and uh, reprogram my brain that it doesn't react to my senses and react in a positive way not in a negative way if i am selfish i'll create something which will not be very good if i'm selfless i will not create anything useless and if i'm Uh, greedy i will be creating something negative if i am not greedy i will not be creating if i have ego i will be creating something not very positive so these qualities human qualities they impact the brain's processing and these qualities are the result of our conditioning in our childhood and continuously over a period of time most of the conditioning is happened during the formative years till the time you become a adult an adult or the youth that's what is purification basically <laughs> the body should be pure the mind body what you eat what you do uh, what the body has been created for something for a specific purpose to work in a specific way we have certain specification but we operate we change the way of it operates we are not op- optimally operating how the brain should be thinking but the brain is processing different we have bugs you know like we have created bugs in the operating system <laughs> what are some examples of these bugs our bugs are basically the wrong conditioning if somebody has taught us to be selfless selfish we should have been selfless but we have been taught to be selfish some parents told us be street smart earn a lot of money but they didn't tell that money does not does not give happiness they did not tell us to differentiate between needs and desires curb your needs what are needs what are your desires unnecessary desires what is a desire what is a need these kind of things uh, like attraction attraction is actually a distraction what what not to be attracted to how to uh, create provide a pure environment we are living in a impure environment with so many impurities there is consumerism there is capitalism we are driven by lust what made us drive uh, you know why did we became so lustful what made us lustful what what we got exposed to how it impl- impacted our mind what kind of patterns we develop what kind of behavior what kind of nature that's conditioning it's upbringing basically and then it we have got a lot of impurities those are bugs so i am giving a scientific and a emotional or a social life analogy to both something else you've written about and made videos about is social issues and you talked about there that the collapse of civilization that you you feel may happen could you elaborate a little on your view on today's social issues uh, civilizational issues etc see uh, there's a there's a constant increase in the mental health problems that it's become pretty obvious now i think everybody is talking about mental health issues and if if next a step behind if you go back uh, we realized over a few two three decades the ca- that uh, there are relationship issues and now we have figures for divorce rates in different different countries you know somewhere it is 80% somewhere it is 75% somewhere it is 70% and also i see a lot of people who are not divorced they are literally on the verge 
or they are unhappy so so why what is the reason of unhappiness what are the challenges we are facing in the world today where are we struggling it is you know, profession employment why there is an employment issue so there is a whole story behind employment issue i have made a video on unemployment now there are various issues and uh, what are the relationship issues why they are happening so relationship and uh, social issues whether professional how those changes came consumerism capitalism uh, the syndicate the politic pol political issues the they are all based on the degrading uh, decaying human values people are becoming more greedy we are uh, diluting our traditional values and norms which kept the society uh, pretty much intact there is one lady in uh, uk st williams you should see her channel she's she is a trad wife she is making interesting videos about trad wife so there is a trad wife movement there was a feminist movement there is a lib women liberation there is women empowerment over the diversity all these narratives which came had a, a vested interest from the capitalists so they they created like politicians like to divide the society so they will see how can i divide the society what kind of rules i can create where so the society can be divided so much that it is even breaks the family relationships i empower the women so much that my consumerism becomes successful i empower the women so much that they will uh, you know fight they will create help for the men and then they are busy fighting and we are ruling so we don't have any challenge opposition because people are now blaming each other we create some social disturbance we create some employment problems and they will never blame us they will only blame each other this is what is happening if a man is unemployed the woman uh, woman is more the more women coming so that the ratio is changing so there will be more men um, uh, unemployed and uh, then the, su the subsequent effect will be the woman will not get uh, a man who is employed and they will not marry an unemployed man though they call about equality they call about uh, women empowerment but you know the, these narratives are not uh, come to total solution provided to the woman and it's easy to fool a woman it is really too easy to manipulate and brainwash a woman and that's what the capitalists have done it very successfully they've sold diamonds they made diamond something very uh, uh, you know precious it's just a stone but you know woman is chasing a diamond and woman can chase a diamond if a man uh, if woman will chase a man who can buy her a diamond so to buy the diamond woman will men will chase money and women will chase a man so you are in a merry go round you are in a whirlpool and the society is busy doing that and the politician is making money out of it because he sells the diamond so so social issues have many triggers and i have written this book basically so i am now making i have made some videos about relationships i have made a video about arranged marriage so what was the benefit of arranged marriage why there was arranged marriage why the joint family system worked how we have become so your nuclear family how we are further getting divided what are the priorities in the life how the materialism is changing how the liberation the feminist movement from where this feminist movement started how the marketing started in america like edward bernays the he was like a marketing guru he he used to do propaganda so propaganda brainwashing this is what the politicians are doing this is what the capitalists together it's a syndicate syndicate of spiritual gurus capitalists criminals politicians media these five pillars they are uh, controlling the world there are few few large corporations who are controlling the world they 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 are greedy and greedy uh, apple runs on a trillion dollar oh, cash why why do they need so much money there is one person or even less than one person are having all the wealth of the 99 person so this is a complete skewed uh, unsocial uh, unsocialist kind of a world uh democratically dictator actually they are dictator they are actually dictator 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 in a guise of a democracy so everything is changing it's come off like there's so much of greed there's so much of loot there's savagery literally savagery so so why it is happening and how it can be undone it's very difficult to undo this stuff it's very difficult to undo and you foresee a a collapse civilizationally if you look at the way it is going and if i look at the way i don't see anything coming out of it so as we say i think we all have read about it that civilizations collapse and uh, and the new civilization comes and we have this theory of theory of yuga 
I feel that we are heading in that direction because I don't see any change happening, positive change coming. Because all the interactions, all whatever I've seen across, I don't see any sanity. There's a lot of fanaticism which is growing by the day. And I don't see that people see religion or spirituality uh, so seriously. Uh, they, 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 people are going through problems and a lot of people look for spiritual solutions, but they don't understand spirituality because they are very foolish. They are stupid and uh, they, the ego, they just don't know. So there's no guidance because there is a horde of fake gurus who are benefiting from this demand. There are a whole lot of coaches in the West who are healers, all kind of coaches. So, so, uh, so the problem is uh, who will initiate this? Who can change the 8 billion population? Who can go at that level and change it? Is it possible? Where are those people who can change it? Are there those people? If suppose I can change it, can I change 8 billion? Are, are there people who are interested in listening to me the real truth? Who, who's there to change it? And who will go to that person? Because people are drawn towards these stupid people. There, recently, there was a stampede. 120 people died two days back in India. And one of the fake gurus congregation. congregation. 120 people died in a stampede. Foolish people. So there, this is what is happening. So how will the masses be changed? So like a, 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 there's a wound in the leg. And at that point of time, you have to ampute the leg because it cannot be healed. So that is what the universe will have to do. The universe has a way of correcting, natural correction. So when the, there's too much of negativity, so then the balance will be done by the nature because then the nature takes over. You see so many typhoons, climate change, so many, it's only America which is getting all those typhoons. Katrina and this thing, I don't know, different names they give, all named after women. But um, uh, if you see so many typhoons coming, there was tsunami, and there's earthquake in Turkey. So, you know, climate changes. If you see it's double and so many cases of air turbulence, air turbulence was there, but now this clean air turbulence. Recently, it was a flight going to Uruguay from somewhere in Europe. And then there was a flight from Singapore Airlines, there was a flight from Oman somewhere in Doha to some country in Europe. There's one more, four flights in last one month have gone through those kind of turbulence. So now people are thinking, is air travel safe or uh, will we have some other technology which will alert us? Because these turbulence are sudden, no information. It's a sudden turbulence through a clean air. So what's, what's that creating? Who knows what kind of toxicity we are creating through these technology, 5G, 4G, 2G, 3G. There was so much of the resistance against 5G technology, 4G technology. If you look, listen to Isaac Asimov, he says that uh, uh, this wireless technology, we are you know, meddling with the uh, spectrum and the air quality. And I mean, it's in purifying. And there are proofs because uh, microwave, higher spectrum microwave, they, they create problems to the humans. Some birds were dying. I was in Warsaw at that time. I, I was... I used to ride my bike, biking, I go cycling, and one day I remember seeing so many birds uh, on the road, dead birds. What can be the cause, suddenly? So, I mean, you really don't know how we are meddling with the environment, polluting it from different ways, air, food, water, but all is being polluted. So how should the yogi respond to such a world situation? Yogi has to focus on himself and uh, continue to do self-inquiry, continue to uh, elevate his consciousness and not worry about future because a yogi lives in the present. He doesn't, he's not afraid of dying. Death is inevitable. Death is a, an event. And it's the death of the body, not of the soul. And I made a video on segregating how the soul is different from the body. How can we understand that? So yogi is not worried about death. Yogi is only worried about living like a right, perfect human being. That's what his endeavor is. And yogi is also setting an example. He's an inspiration for others to see how best we can live. How much we have this, uh, you know, come off the track. And we have no idea. And uh, what we call see is good is actually extremely bad. And yogi is there, but yogi is a rare thing. So people hardly get across a yogi and they don't see inspiration from a yogi. 
they seek inspiration from politicians and capitalists and industrialists and all those rich people you know that's what attracts them so their core values are greed and selfishness laziness want want instant gratification impulsive they are completely driven differently and so yogi has his own way he is not worried about how the world goes he wo- goes against the tide yogi goes against the tide and that's what the yogi does he has realized what the truth is so he is following something which the world is not following but that doesn't deter him shiv this has been a fascinating conversation thank you so much as we bring this interview to an end is there anything else that you'd like to say that we haven't touched on yet i think there must be many topics uh, but uh, i can't really think of something else and uh, probably my i think my battery is also about to finish i realized and uh, so maybe we can if you see if you think of something more we can probably have another conversation and do another recording right now i can't think of i don't know nothing is coming into my mind right now what i can talk you know great then we'll perhaps we'll perhaps we'll talk again Shiv Mathur, sure. thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Steve. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.